All right. This is part three, day three, of Dr. Andrew, what is his name, Clark, uh, testimony on the stand. So far, they've covered, she's been, she showed signs of schizophrenia since she was six. Now, I don't know, I didn't see any evidence yet that come out. This is just he saying that from his interview with her, this is what she has told him. She was taking the um, sleep stuff. Her mom was uh, the over-the-counter, and her mom just started giving her just one. She was taking two. It's not doing any good for her. She has problems sleeping. I believe it's called serotonin. Um and then she was on Zoloft, 25 milligrams. They uh, wasn't doing nothing for her. They upped it to 50. She didn't like the way it was making her feel. She felt numb, felt zombie-like. This is what she's saying. So they prescribed her uh, a 5 milligram of, um, what is that other stuff? Uh, I guess it was the Zoloft. And uh, then they, they described her five milligrams of the Lexapro. Okay, my bad. I was looking at my scratchy chicken scratch writing of the uh, so five milligrams of that. And she was supposed to wing down off of the 50 milligram of the Zoloft. But she, she tells the doctor she just stopped taking it. Right? And then in my last video, I had said, well, I mean... I would think any parent would be monitoring this and would just let her just stop taking something like that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little confused on how that is going about. And uh, obviously she's saying she had issues. Uh, they've also discussed since she was a child, since she was four, she had a sibling who died at like uh, so many months old. Her sister had passed away. And that was traumatic to her. And then her parents split up. And then she had traumatic experiences visiting her biological father. He is a goofball, basically, in a nutshell, that he would just not even not talk to her or feed her or give her beverages. This kind of thing is what she is saying. I don't know if anything was done with the social services through that. I don't know. This is just, you know, I'm still diving into this. And I think so far the testimony has been quite fascinating. Uh, the, uh, the defense laying out the case. And I do think that uh, this doctor is the meat and potatoes of their whole defense. I'm thinking they're going to, this is just my opinion so far, and I haven't watched the rest of this. I know the, the case is over. I haven't even watched the video of, of her being um, convicted. But anyway, it should, or, you know, what, what are they going to do with her? So, but so far, I mean, th I think this is their meat and potatoes that they're going to, they're going for. Well, them bringing up that she could stop taking it. He didn't want to use the term cold turkey, but apparently she didn't wing herself off or her mother didn't uh, wing her off of this other medicine. And uh, did that cause her psychosis? Is she still hearing voices? I don't know. I'm wanting to know. Did Because she claimed she heard, was hearing voices. And they, the voices were telling her that she's better than everybody else. Okay, this is what this is what he had said so far in interviewing her. So, a lot of interesting stuff going on there. So let's find out what is he going to say next. Now the defense is still uh, examining him. We have not got a crack. The prosecution ain't got a crack at him, and I am so looking forward to that. By the way. Prescriber had mentioned trying to put Carly on Prozac. I believe that at the initial visit with Precise Clinical, what they reported in their records was that Ashley, Miss um, Smiley, told them that when she was younger, she had been put on Prozac and she had become suicidal quite immediately, and so really did not want Carly on Prozac. 
Yeah. How did Carly's personality begin to change at school after her dosage change? Well, obviously, I haven't heard evidence that, that he made any comment um, in earlier testimony from my first video, which would have been part two, day three, that, that Carly has said she is suicidal. Now, I said her mother's suicidal. I mean, hurting yourself and hurting somebody else is, is two, way two different things. I mean, they're both tragic. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But to uh, to to be suicidal or to kill somebody else is is drastically different. Um, after her dosage, after of, her medication changed. So there were a number of things going on by March 12th, um, and I guess I'm not. Are you asking? How she changed yes. the school after that? Yes. So, my understanding is that Carly managed to be very effective at doing well in school, showing up, looking engaged, and getting good marks. Um, however, I also understand that beginning sometime in February of 2024, Carly began smoking marijuana at school. What did you learn about Carly's use of marijuana? What I learned was that sometime in February of 2024, um, so perhaps six weeks or so before the incident, Carly began smoking marijuana. She told me that she smoked two or three times a week. I think she told a clinician at the uh, correctional center she may have smoked up to four times a week. Uh, but not every day, but, but, but a number of times a week. She told me that she smoked both at night to kind of help her with her anxiety and to help her sleep, and sometimes during the day uh, when, when, when she was at school. And, you know, why was it that, you know, why was it that Carly turned to the marijuana usage? So, what I know is that Carly reported that she used marijuana to help her deal with anxiety and stress. Um, so, which I think is a, it's a very common reason for adolescents with mental health difficulties to begin smoking marijuana. Would that typically be described as self-medicating? Yes. Okay. And in your experience, is that something people tend to do when they're experiencing symptoms of, uh, you know, any medical issue that's aggravating them? I don't know about any medical issue, but but in my experience, I mean, I think two things two things can happen. One is some adolescents start smoking marijuana because they enjoy smoking marijuana. Um, I was going to say that. But others who are struggling with mental health difficulties um, start smoking marijuana because it just it helps them feel better. I think especially, if, uh, listen, my experience, adolescents who've been taking medication when the medication just doesn't work very well, they get a little frustrated or a little discouraged, and it's like, and they smoke marijuana, and at least in the short run, they feel a little bit better. Based on your experience, expertise, and evaluation of Carly, how was the marijuana likely to have caused or affected her symptoms? So, I have a lot of patients that smoke marijuana, uh, I, will, I will say. Uh, it's legal in Massachusetts, which may make a difference. Um, but, and so, typically, with individuals who smoke marijuana, what I find is that it may help their anxiety in the short run, Many people report that it helps them feel, uh, I'm sorry, helps them sleep better. Um, it typically doesn't worsen uh, a mood disorder. It typically doesn't worsen anxiety. Um, my primary concern with people that smoke marijuana is that they are less engaged in life. They're spending their time high rather than actually doing things. For Carly, particularly her being in school, I'd be concerned that, that she just was, wasn't doing as well academically. Um, and if Carly had friends who, were, who had feelings against marijuana, it just puts her kind of at odds with some, with some of her friends who are not smoking. Based on your evaluation and the records you reviewed, did Carly's academic performance begin to suffer at this time? As far as I can tell, not. Um, the only thing is that Carly reported to me that on March 19th, the day of the incident, she um, woke up 
grumpy and irritable and couldn't pay attention in school. And she said that was the first time that it ever happened. She'd always been able to really focus well in school, but on that particular day, she just could not pay attention. What, if anything, did Carly tell you in regards to smoking marijuana on March 19th? What Carly told me was that she had not smoked marijuana on March 19th, that she thought she had smoked on Monday, March 18th. And do you recall why Carly said she didn't smoke marijuana on March 19th? I actually don't. Okay. Um, what were your conclusions based, uh, what were your conclusions about Carly's mental health at that time between January to March 19th? Yes, I have a, a few, I think. One is that I think Carly was struggling with a significant mood disorder. She had been, she had reported to her clinician that she was depressed. They had diagnosed her with depression. They were treating her with depression. It wasn't very effective at that point in time. But in addition, I asked Carly about um, what is called hypomania. And hypomania is a condition where a person's mood is elevated. Um, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna give a little background. So in psychiatry, there's, there's major depressive disorder, or what's sometimes called unipolar depression, where a person is either depressed or they're normal. Um, but there's another condition called bipolar disorder. And classic bipolar disorder is one in which an individual often oscillates between being really depressed and then being manic. And when you're manic, your mood is very high, you're full of energy, your thoughts may be going fast, um, you, are, you feel often bigger than life, you can be more confident, and it beca can become a very unstable and dangerous state. People often have very poor judgment, they take a great deal of risk, they can spend a lot of money, and they can become really quite psychotic when they're manic. I don't think that happened with Carly, but there is a condition called hypomania, which is elevated mood, but not as severe as mania. Hypomania is um, where your, your mood is up, you're full of energy, you feel good, you're confident, you're funny, you're thinking fast, you're smart, you're on top of the world. It's actually, people actually often enjoy it. Like nobody comes to psychiatrists complaining that they've been hypomanic. But for people that have, and, and there's a condition called bipolar two in which an individual suffers from depressed mood, but also at times a hypomanic mood. And the hypomanic mood is not the problem, the depressed mood is the problem. But it makes a difference because when you treat bipolar two with an antidepressant medication, you often can make things worse. Either, either nothing gets better, or you can make someone worse because you can drive them into a manic state. Um, and I think of it, I often say to patients, it's like having a boat without a keel. If you don't have a stable mood and you're cranking up the motor, you're going to be zigzagging all over the lake. And that's what often happens when you treat someone with bipolar disorder with an antidepressant medication. They can have significant problems. So, okay. So she's being treated for depression. Why is she not being treated for if he said that she, in the other video earlier, I'm going to put the link in the description. You guys can watch this whole thing. <clears throat> he said that she told him she was hearing voices starting at age six and up. When did the voices stop? That's a sign of schizophrenia. You are hearing voices. Why was she not being treated for schizophrenia? You're just going to be treated for... Did she not tell nobody else that she heard voices? She goes and says she's, she's depressed. What's going on here? I, I don't know. I, I hope the jury is paying attention to this, obviously. Th that's my, my... Ever since he brought that up, my... Boom. I'm like, whoa, this is huge. And now we're going to talk about being bipolar... And then now her mood is elevated, so she woke up bitchy in the morning. So she's grumpy. Her mood is elevated, not to where she's on top of everything. She, he was saying that she wasn't the first time she ever experienced not being able to focus at school. 
Excuse me. So, what, she wakes up, she's grumpy, she can't focus at school, she comes home, she kills her mom? I don't know, guys. I, I'm still I'm still harping on the schizophrenia. That's big. That's huge. Why would she not be treated for that? Maybe we'll find out. Let's see. Oh, I asked Carly very specifically about hypomania, and part of the reason I asked her was because my understanding is that her biological father has been diagnosed and treated with bipolar for bipolar disorder. And bipolar disorder is a very is a highly heritable condition, meaning if you have a parent that has it, you're at much increased risk of having it yourself. So a teenager with depressed mood with a parent with bipolar disorder is at a high risk of having bipolar bipolar as, as well. So I asked Carly, what she reported to me was that she has had for the last several years regular discrete periods of time when her mood is up, when she's more restless, she's more impulsive, she's more rude, she's more tactless, she's physically somewhat agitated, um, and she'll take risks. She told me that she got her nipple pierced when she, um, um, when, she, when she was in that state. She told me so. She told me that she had these clear-cut states uh, and had been having them for a number of years. Um, she told me that I asked her to estimate over the last five years how much of your time have you spent in any state. What she said to me was over the last five years she thought about 60% of her time in a depressed state, about 20% of her time in a hypomanic state, and about 20% of her time in a, a normal mood state. So, Well, you would think that most teenagers are impulsive. They act on the moment. That is probably kind of normal. Unless they fear their parents to get their butt whooped or they're going to be grounded. I, I, I don't know, I, guys. I'm just trying to, to figure this out of what he is saying that Carly is telling him. That she she acts on impulse. She, in a heightened state, that she goes and gets her nipples pierced. That That sounds like typical teenage crap. Doing something stupid. That I don't know. Let me know if I'm wrong. I gave her the diagnosis of bipolar two uh, disorder. Your Honor, may I approach? Carly's taking notes again. Dr. She, Clark, she, did she's you worked out. I'm bipolar. Carly's medical records from Precise Medical Clinic. I did. I want to know what he's going to say about the video. Oh, man. No, Guys. I have a copy of those documents. Can you tell me what the exhibit number of that is? Exhibit, uh, defendant, defendant's exhibit 19. Okay. And uh, what records are those? These are the records from um, Precise Medical for Carly Gregg. Okay. And if you will, if you'll see at the very bottom, there's uh, a little red state versus Carly Gregg. Yes. Uh, and with numbers, if you could, will you turn to page 761 in those records? Yes. And will you read, will you tell me what we're looking at on this page? Yes, what we're looking at, at is something that's called the modified mini screen, which appears to be a series of questions that were asked of Carly, I, I imagine, I would think, prior to her visit with the clinician. And what would be the purpose of having her fill out this mini screen? The purpose of these screens are to try to flag any possible problems. Um, so it's also it's also time saving. So you ask a number of questions to try to identify what might be the problem areas, and then presumably when the clinician sees the individual, they can focus in on those and ask follow up questions. Is this something that would typically be helpful for diagnostic reasons? Yeah, I'd say more than anything, it raises questions. It allows the clinician to kind of focus their, 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 their interview questions. Okay. And could you read that first question for me? Question number one is, have you been consistently depressed or down most of the day, nearly every day, for the past two weeks? And how did Carly answer that? Carly answered yes. And could you read question number four for me? Question number four was, in the past month, did you think that you would be better off dead or, or wish you were dead? And how did Carly respond to that? Carly, Carly answered yes. Okay. Will you read question number five? Question number five says, have you ever had a period of time when you were feeling up, hyper, or so full of energy or full of yourself that you got into trouble 
or that other people thought you were not your usual self, parentheses, do not consider times when you were intoxicated on drugs or alcohol, end parentheses. How did Carly respond to that? Carly responded, yes. Could you read question number seven? Question number seven was, have you had one or more occasions when you felt intensely anxious, frightened, uncomfortable, or uneasy, even when most people would not feel that way? Did these intense feelings get to be their worst within 10 minutes? Uh, parentheses, if the answer to both questions is yes, select yes, otherwise select no. How did Carly answer that question? Carly answered yes. Okay. And will you read question number eight for me? Question number eight, do you feel anxious or uneasy in places or situations where you might have the panic-like symptoms we just spoke about? Or do you feel anxious or uneasy in situations where help might not be available or escape might be difficult? Examples, being in a crowd, standing in a line, being alone away from home or alone at home, crossing a bridge, traveling in a bus, train, or car. How did Carly answer that question? She answered yes. Could you read question number nine for me? Question number that still ain't telling me it justified her going and getting a Magnum, a 357 Magnum, and blowing her mother's face off. Because she is depressed. I, I, guys, I'm just saying so far. I mean, we're almost two hours into his testimony. Between my last video and this one, well, we're 20 minutes in. I, it's still not giving a justification. Okay, so she answered a question. Is she better off uh, dead? And she said, yeah. Now, how many times when you were a kid, you were like, man, I wish I was never born. I'm just hating my life right now. I think, I think we've all, everybody on the planet has thought that to some extent but that's to yourself that's not to, to to harm somebody else that's on a whole nother level a whole nother level and how many of you out there have your parents pissed you off you're like oh i can't stand it when they do this oh, they're just driving me crazy but did it pop in your head to go kill them or you had a manic episode in the moment? I, I I don't know. I'm just I'm just not buying it. I'm just not buying it so far. I am just not buying it. Number nine. Have you worried excessively or been anxious about several things over the past six months? And how did Carly answer that question? Yes. Could you read question number 12 for me? In the past month, have you been bothered by thoughts, impulses, or images that you couldn't get rid of that were unwanted, distasteful, inappropriate, intrusive, or distressing? And how did Carly answer that question? She answered yes. Could you answer question, could you read question number 13 for me? In the past month. She just yawned. And she's a heavy blinker. He's just blinking. And she yawned. She's, she's, she's tired, y'all. Did you do something repeatedly without being able to resist doing it? And how did Carly respond to that question? She answered yes. And could you, uh, could you read question number 14? Have you ever experienced, witnessed, or had to deal with an extremely traumatic event that included actual or threatened death or serious injury to you or someone else? And how did Carly answer that question? Yes. Okay. And Damn. what stood out to you in your review of precise medical records? What really stood out to me was their question about, have you ever been up or hyper? Um, and, and I saw no indication. And this, this is, I understand this to be a question that really is screening for mania. You're looking to see whether bipolar disorder of some sort might be a problem. And Carly answered yes to that. Um, and, and I saw no evidence in the records from Precise Clinical that they had followed up on that. And they ended up not asking her about mania, according to their records, and prescribing her antidepressant medication, which in retrospect might not have been the best choice. How, based on your experience and expertise, 
How difficult is it to diagnose uh, mental health issues in teenagers? Well, it can be tricky um, for a couple of reasons. And one is that a lot of times teenagers are, if they have a mental health issue, it's just starting to come to fruition at this period of time. It can be a little hard to know. Um, and you know, there's a wide range of kind of normal teenage behavior. And teenagers aren't always terribly forthcoming to an adult. Um, and so, you know, it's, you have to establish rapport, often get information from other places, uh, and hopefully the teenager can, can open up with, to you. There's some things that are maybe easier to diagnose than others, but it's not, it's not always simple. Okay, so Carly's depressed. Carly's got mental illness. Is she on medication right now? It just occurred to me to, to ask that. Is she on medication right now? Because it's only been a year since she she killed her mother. So did the, the depression go away? Or she's still depressed and she's still anxious. Now, what's her anxiousness now? Is she going to serve life in prison? That's what she's probably angsting about and have some anxiety. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just guessing here. What would? I mean, good God. I don't know how I would be thinking if I was, because obviously I never killed anybody and I'm not going to, but that, I'm just saying, I mean, what what does she think right now? Is it an absurd question to think? No, I don't think so. You're thinking, I, I know a lot of people in the chat, like, oh, she's just sitting there and, then, you know, we're all making comments like, okay, she's still, is she doodling? Is she drawing? What kind of notes is she taking? You know, uh, commenting on her clothes. But uh, let's think, what is she thinking about? Is she has anxiety? Is she still bipolar? Does she still hear voices? Is she taking medication now? Is the, the jail people giving her medication to calm her? Is she a danger to herself? I don't know. I think these are the legitimate questions. Based on your experience and expertise, um, when you are uh, having sessions with teenagers, how confidential are their sessions? It's mixed. Uh, what I, al I always start out when I'm meeting with a teenager and talking about confidentiality. And I usually say to them, again, depending on the age, I say, I can give you some privacy. You deserve some privacy, but if issues come up that really affect your um, health or safety or significantly affect your welfare, we got to pull your parents in. We, 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 we got to let them know. So I think every teenager kind of understands that um, the really serious stuff, the parents going to get pulled in. So you're telling and me teenagers <laughs> understand. Yeah. What, if any, concerns did Carly already have um, about having bipolar disorder? So what Carly reported to me was that she had been worried that she might end up like her father um, and that her mother had, especially between Jan especially after all this happened in December, that her mother had frequently said to her something like, uh, you might be, uh, something like you're gonna end up just like your father. And she, Carly understood her father to have a serious psychiatric illness. So Carly reported to me that she really wasn't worried that she might have a serious psychiatric illness. Did Carly see her father as a successful person? No. Based on your experience and expertise, what would motivate someone to not be forthcoming with their doctor? So there are probably probably a number of re a number of re reasons. I think many teenagers don't really want to go talk to a, a psychiatrist or, or 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 even a therapist. But certainly, shame is one. Shame and stigma are big. There are a lot of people that engage in denial, uh, that they just don't want to believe that they have a condition. And they think, they like to think that they can kind of soldier through. Um, and, 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 and they say to themselves that it's really, it's really not that bad. A lot of, I think, teenagers in particular, again, are worried that their parents are going to find out. Um, and it's actually still fairly common for people to be worried that they're going to end up uh, in a psychiatric hospital, if, they, if they're, uh, especially around things like suicide, um, talking about suicidal thoughts. But just in general, they worry that, that you're just going you're, you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna lock me up in a hospital. Based on your experience and expertise, how common is it for people to be afraid of receiving a mental health diagnosis? 
I think it can be very difficult for people. I think especially, you know, I mean, depression doesn't quite have that same punch. But bipolar disorder, for example, or certainly any time you talk about psychosis, I think it's a very big deal for most people to try to come to terms with that. Um, because they worry, uh, understandably, about you know, what, the, what, what, the, what, what, what it means, what the future might hold for them. Based on your evaluation of Carly. Well, she didn't put the emphasis on what the future might hold for her if she kills somebody. Just saying. And your interview with her and the records you reviewed. How could Carly be experiencing these significant symptoms of mental illness, but her parents not know when they live with her and see her every day? So I'll say maybe, maybe two things. I, I think one is, I think many teenagers are pretty good at hiding things from their parents. I mean, it's a... <clears throat> I'm glad she brought that question up. And as I, I stated in my last video, I had family members... Who have, I have family members who are diagnosed with schizophrenia and things like that. And uh, talking to my mom about it years later, because some incidents had come up, uh, having to deal with the police and having to do things and even go as far as go to court and things like this. And she told me, she's like, because I said, well, why did the court rule this way? She said, well, because he is smart she we're talking about the family member who is has the mental problems she said he is very aware of what's going on and he knows not to act crazy or obviously act upon the psychosis that he has in front of certain people this is what she told my mother told me and I was just in my early 20s when she was telling me this, because obviously when, when all this was going on, I was I was young. She wasn't going to talk to me in this teenager and tell me this stuff. It was later on, I'm like asking these questions like, okay, well, why didn't they do this when you went to court? Or why didn't they do that? She said, because when he goes in there, he knows not to talk crazy. He's actually smart. He's not going to go in there and tell them that he hears voices and that the voice told him to do certain things or, you know. I won't go into more details on why, why they had to go to court, but this this is what she's she's telling me. And it, it's interesting that they brought that up. It's like, how did her parents not know that Carly is suffering from these these mental things? Because Carly knows when to act a certain way around other people. It's almost like just normal people. Okay, well, I'll call myself a normal person to some extent, right? To where you, you're going to talk differently around different people. Like if you have a friend and y'all yuck it up about a certain thing, you're probably not going to act the same way as you do towards talking to somebody else or your grandparents or your parents or whatever the case may be. You act on... And and I think that's just normal behavior anyway, right? To to be a certain way, there's always like what is the saying? There's always a time and place for everything. I think Carly knew when, what how to act. She she knows, Matt. That that's just my opinion and my experiences with with past things that's happened in my family. That uh, they know what's going on and they know when to act and when not to act upon and then he talked about shame and stuff like that i i don't think she was shameful I, i'm i don't think she has any shame i'm just saying feel that most teenagers develop um and so and especially you know if a teenager spends a lot of time in their bedroom for example they may not see a lot of their parents um and the second thing is i think carly has said to me and she has said to others that she's really pretty good at putting on a face um, that she's able to put on a good face even when uh, um, things are quite difficult. And I think we certainly saw, I saw evidence of that um, in reviewing the records. I, I think uh, most teenagers, like he said, I think most teenagers do know how to do that. I mean, when I was a teenager, I, I smoked cigarettes. Di was I going to tell my parents and let them know what I'm doing? Now, my parents smoked. My mother had quit. I think when I was around 12 or something, she had quit smoking and then didn't smoke for the rest of her life, by the way. 
It was crazy. But anyway. So it's not like they could smell it on me, but I, I hit it. I hit smoking. Now, look, we're talking back late 70s. I mean, anyway, of course, teenagers do stuff. And they're not going to tell their parents or let them know about it. That's just teenage behavior. That's just, I think that's just natural and part of it. Plus, she's a little creepy kid on top of, I think she's a sociopath. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just, just watching from the very beginning of the trial to now how she is. She's coming across as, as uh, a sociopath and narcissistic. Oh, and the narcissistic guys might come up if it's true that she heard voices. And what did the voices tell her? The doctor said she's better than everybody else. Narcissistic people are better than everybody else. Sociopathic people is it's all about me. I only cry and feel sorry when it is about me. And this is Carly in a nutshell, but I haven't heard him mention sociopath or narcissistic. We've just heard bipolar and depression and one little hint of schizophrenia, which I haven't heard another hint about was she ever treated for schizophrenia. Okay, I hope the prosecution or she or somebody comes back around to it because I'm still harping on that. It's like, uh, I want to hear some more about that and why wasn't she treated for it? And did the voices tell her to do it? Or, boom, are we going to get a bo another, well, I don't know if it'd be a bombshell, but, oh, it's it's the medication. She stopped taking the medication. They planted that seed. She stopped cold turkey. All right. And what do you attribute that to, Carly's ability to put on a good face? I think I attribute it, I think, in part to her... Well, actually, I understand Carly to have, from an early age, had this idea, this feeling that she needed to kind of... She, that she needed to um, be aware of her mother's emotional state, that she needed to make sure her mother was doing okay, she needed to kind of help her mother not worry so much, and so that she did lots of things like watch a movie together with her mother that her mother wanted to watch, or read a book that her mother wanted her to read. Um, she did lots of things to help kind of calm her mother. Um, uh, so I think, I think that's a big reason. I think the fact that Carly's bright maybe allowed her to, to get away a little better. Um, but I think she really is, really has a personality where she's very good um, at putting a smile on her face and functioning reasonably well. You think that could be a form of manipulation? I always tell my kid when I'm like, oh, you're kissing my butt. Why? No, 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 I'm not. I was like, oh, so you all of a sudden, I didn't have to remind you to do a chore. You've done everything today. What's going on? And I pointed out and he laughs about it because it is funny. Oh, yeah, you're wanting to go to a dance or you're wanting to go to a ball game. So, oh, okay, that's why you're making sure you've done all your chores this week because at the end of the week, you want to do X, Y, Z. And we laugh about it. And actually, it's a good thing. I mean, because if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, he doesn't get to go do things, right? So maybe maybe Carly is somehow this manipulative uh, keeping her mom calm. Maybe she's learned that. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking out of the box here. I don't know. Maybe she... Uh, kids learn how to be manipulative. They know. They know they can kiss butt or do whatever they're doing to, to try to... Uh, or either change subjects and avoid if, if something's going to come her way of getting in trouble. I don't know. Right? It makes sense to me. This, maybe she crafted being manipulative. I don't know. Let's find out. During your interview with Carly, um, how you know, would you say that she minimized her symptoms or did she overplay them? Oh, I'm sorry. Did... During your interview with Carly, did you find that she minimized her symptoms or did she have a tendency to overplay them? <clears throat> Good question. In my interview with Carly, I did find that she minimized her symptoms. I thought she really led with this idea that she was doing just fine. Um, that, 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 and I, I had to work. 
um, to get her to answer certain questions. I, I worked harder with her than I, use, than I usually do with, with, with adolescents in terms of asking specific questions around things that were not going well. Um, so certainly through the interview and then through other uh, um, documents as well, um, I thought I saw significant evidence of denial and minimization. So, so Carly minimized her, her, her mental status to him. Now keep in mind, he interviews her after she has killed her mother. What does that mean? I had to work really hard to get her more than I worked with other patients her age. I had to work hard to get it out of her. So, I don't know. Is that telling me that she's minimized it? Now she's using the insanity defense. I don't know, guys. That This line of questioning, it's, it's very questionable. What does this mean? Now, are auditory hallucinations or hearing voices here we go. Typically, what someone with bipolar two disorder is going to be experiencing? No. The short answer is no. It's not not usual for someone with bipolar two disorder to have to hear voices. Um, sometimes people that get very depressed, um, very depressed, can experience auditory hallucinations, hear voices along with that. People that are manic can absolutely uh, experience auditory hallucinations. They can become very psychotic. But otherwise, it's really not not at all common. And based on what you reviewed in preparing for your evaluation of Carly, were there any indications in any documents where Carly had reported hearing voices prior to March 19th? Yes. Okay. Where? So the document in particular was her journal entry from March 12th of 2024, one week before the incident. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, ma'am. I appreciate Carly's journal into evidence. Um, I'll just hand you that. Now, you mentioned a journal entry from March 9th, March 12th? Correct. Okay. And is that the journal entry that I've handed you there? It is. Is that the same journal entry that you reviewed? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me what about that journal entry stood out to you in your review? Would you like for me to read it? Yes. Um, um, so, so Carly had kept a journal. Uh, it's, it looked like it began in January of 2024, um, just after the um, after she'd been found by her mother uh, to have been engaging in these behaviors. She kept the journal through much of January and then dropped off. And then this, as I recall, was the only entry in March. Um, so, writing in, on March 12th, Tuesday, she writes, "I think I had a psychotic break earlier." The whole ordeal was quite silly. I actually spoke with one of the voices in my head. Well, I didn't hear them until earlier today, but I only do then. My particular friend and I were practically screaming, bloodthirstily and ravenously. Thank God, dash, physical confrontation was not, and I think it's fruitively, possible. I sound crazy. And then she goes on to say, I need to get back into the habit of journaling that think it's good. I haven't quite decided if I'll bring this stupid thing to Miss Kirk, Mrs. Kirk, her therapist, tomorrow, but I just, ah, uh, I can't decide. Exclamation mark. Your Honor, may I approach? Did you hmm. also have an opportunity to review a sketchbook that Carly had? Yes. And that sketchbook has been placed into evidence by stipulation. What, if anything, in Carly's sketchbook that you reviewed in preparing for her um, interview and evaluation stood out to you? I think there was, there was um, one particular page of her sketchbook. It's titled a 2023-2024 sketchbook that stood out. I will say, I don't quite know what to make of it, but I find it raises mm, disturbing questions. Okay. What was it that stood out to you that raised these disturbing questions to you? So this was, as I understand it, a, a, a free sheet of paper that was folded up and put in the sketchbook that was then found at the house um, after the incident that was written in green ink in what looks to me to be a, uh, a, um, a different hand or different handwriting than Carly's other handwriting. And it's written 
almost like a piece of creative writing. It's in the, in the, in the, in the sort of guise of, of, of a soldier um, with a different name. And she writes, or whoever wrote this wrote, wrote, anywho, I don't think I'll make it any longer. And then the writing becomes quite um, primitive uh, and large and sort of scrawling. And it says, please help me, please help me. I don't something, I'm sorry. And then the next line, it goes back to the kind of more ordered writing um, um, that, that had been happening in the above paragraph. And I think it signed something like Germa. And when I asked Carly about this, she said that she had no idea what I was talking about. Did you ask anybody else about that writing? I spoke to Mr. Heath Smiley uh, about some of the writings, and he told me that he and um, uh, Ashley, Miss Smiley, had found several writings in a journal in Carly's room that had been hidden away, sequestered away, that seemed to be of dark themes, um, and they were worried about it, and they asked Carly about it, and Carly said that she had no recollection. Mr. Smiley also told me that some of the writing was seemed to be in a different handwriting, um, but that Carly disavowed uh, ha having written it. So is she is she possessed by demons, people? What's going on here? We all know Sybil had different personalities. Can this be possible here? She doesn't recall writing it, but it's in her room. I'm just asking questions. So, is she possessed? Does she have some kind of different multiple personalities? That there's a violent, evil personality split off to write this? Just asking. Okay. And could you look at the second page that I gave you there, sir? Yes. Was that also... Um, in the sketchbook that you reviewed? I actually don't recall whether this is in a sketchbook or in a different journal. That's uh, the one titled April 7th. Okay. And uh, what about that uh, entry concerned you? So, so I'll just say, Mr. Smiley told me that this, he believed, was from 2023. So April 7th, 2023, 11 months before the incident. And it, she writes in here, I'm a schizophrenic person. I'm crazy. I miss the comfort in being sane. I just want to find true love. Then maybe I wouldn't be so crazy. My thoughts envelop me. I'm scared. I need help. And I'm happy to talk about... Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether this is just the writings of an emotional, somewhat dramatic teenage girl keeping a journal. It could be. Right? So I, I don't take this as evidence that she had a thought disorder. I do think it's reasonable to think that she's worried. She was worried about her mental health at this point in time. What, if anything, had Carly, did Carly disclose to you about uh, her father having schizophrenia? And so Carly told me that her father had bipolar disorder, and I believe she said that he may have had or was being that had been evaluated for schizophrenia, but it really was the bipolar diagnosis that she was most clear about. Okay. So schizophrenia and bipolar disorder were two things that Carly was worried about. I think that's fair to say, yes. Okay. And this journal entry, according to her stepdad, would have occurred sometime in April of 2023. Yes. Can you tell the court a little bit about what schizophrenia is? So schizophrenia is a serious mental illness. It's a psychiatric diagnosis that's considered to be chronic and typically has a um, kind of worsening course over time. It most frequently manifests in sort of late adolescence, early adulthood, early adulthood and it's characterized by um, psychosis, so, dis so delusions and hallucinations. Also, disorganized thinking, disorganized behavior, um, um, and, and there's a whole range of what are called negative symptoms of just having less interest, less engagement. It can be treated with antipsychotic medication typically, but the medications we have are not great. Frequently, people need to be hospitalized, often several times, 
uh, in, in, in their lifetime. Uh, it can be, so it can be very disabling. It really is, you know, perhaps, I think fair to say, the most um, catastrophic of all psychiatric diagnoses. Are, you, know, you talked about psychosis just a moment ago. Can you yeah, but he had said earlier that she said she claimed she heard voices since she was six. Now, the only thing I can understand or hear so far is they were only treating her for depression, not for schizophrenia. Can you explain for us what psychosis is? Yes. So psychosis is a psychiatric condition. I think I define it as a substantial disorder of thought form or thought content. And thought content really means delusions and hallucinations. If you're hearing voices, if you think the CIA has implanted a, a receiver in your molar, right? If you think the police are following you everywhere you go, those are considered to be delusions. If you're hearing voices or seeing things, those are hallucinations. But people can also have disorder of thought form where they just are not logical and coherent. Their thoughts just don't fit together very well and they can become quite illogical, quite, quite irrational and quite, quite disorganized. And what do you mean by disorganized thinking? So disorganized thinking is where, I mean, normally, normally our thoughts go from one thing to another and they're reasonably well connected and there's an element of a degree of coherence. Disorganized thinking is when often people can jump from one thing to the other to the other. Things don't connect. You know, they'll start talking about one thing and then they'll make a jump to another thing, they'll make a jump to another thing and it's just, it can become a, a, a jumble. And what, if anything, did Carly inform you of with regard to an eating disorder? So Carly told me that for at least the last few years she had at times um, restricted her food intake, um, at times had um, 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 binged and then purged by making herself throw up. She told me that she had never taken laxatives or diuretics but that she had been engaging in these eating disorder behaviors for you know on, on, on a somewhat regular basis. Um, she told me that she had never actually lost a substantial amount of weight, um, but she'd been doing these things um, for at least a couple of years. And so she was having, if I may, mm -hmm. um, mood issues, eating disorder issues, cutting herself, hearing voices, and sleeping difficulty, um, all, I guess, leading up to um, January of 2024. Yeah, but she, I still haven't heard that she was treated for schizophrenia. This is serious. And he even said that is the most serious one of them all. He just said it. Maybe not in those words, but that's what he's saying. Why was she able to go to school with other children? Schizophrenia is dangerous. They actually, now my family member actually literally, either they had a dream or they, they, they would think something was so real. They literally thought it's a situation happened and then now in this other situation they're acting on it in reality because they thought this, this first action part to make them react really happened and it did it. Like maybe, let's say for instance, they thought somebody came up and hit them with a bat while they were asleep. This is, this is true. I'm, I'm telling you a true event. They claimed that somebody hit them with a bat while they were asleep. Because when, and I said, well, why? I asked him, why, why do you think they hit you with the bat? He said, because my arm hurt when I got up. And I knew it was because this person hit me with a bat. So they went to attack this person to get to get back at him. Like, oh, you're not going to get away with hitting me with a bat while I'm asleep. They really thought this happened. And it, and it didn't happen. Now, I'm not seeing that she's had any kind of delusion like that. I don't know. I haven't heard it yet. Can you, do, can you tell the court what disassociation means? Dissociation is a psychiatric term um, that um, is somewhat broad, but the definition is um, a disruption of the normal integrity of 
um, identity, awareness, memory, body sensation, um, um, and, conne and connection with the world, um, which may not mean a lot. Dissociation can be both very mild and quite severe. Mild dissociation, which I think almost all of us have experienced, can include things like just spacing out, right? If you're like driving down the road, you're thinking about something else, you miss your exit, cause, and, or you get home and you have no idea how you got there, right? That's a mild form of dissociation. Um, now, I, I call that my superpower. You get all the way home from something that you do every day repetitively. It's like your brain knows. It's like getting up and throwing away a piece of trash. You automatically know where the garbage can is. So say you rearrange your home and you move the trash can in a different spot. And that trash can's been in that spot for several years. But you rearranged the kitchen. Guess what? And y'all know this to be true. You go throw the, p the trash away, and guess what? Your brain is going to where the trash can was automatically. Automatically. I, I call that your superpower. We rearranged some stuff in the kitchen. Like I guess it was a week ago. <clears throat> now that he said that, it's making me think of it. And we moved the microwave to another spot. She wanted to read. We did the, redid the counter, uh, the organizing, whatever. Guess what? For several days, my brain kept going, and still, I'm still kind of going towards where the microwave used to be when I heat up my coffee or whatever. Your brain goes automatically, and driving home, he's saying it's disassociation, maybe in some instances, but not that. I didn't think that was a good analogy. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just going to disagree with him, because I think if you... You got the same job you you've worked for several years and you're driving home. And then you get home and go, "Wow, man, I got home quick. I'm not even sure all the lights and everything cuz cuz you just boom, that's your superpower. That's just instinctive. Dissociation can include something called derealization, depersonalization, where people feel as if they're just apart from the world. Uh, that the world is somehow distant or gauzy or that she's, they're just not engaged. They can feel they're just f emotionally flat. Some people have that on a chronic basis uh, and it's, um, uh, um, it can be quite d d distressing for them. Dissociation is a part of sometimes post-traumatic stress disorder where people, for example, let's say someone who's had a serious trauma such as a, a combat veteran has a, um, something might trigger them and they'll just go off. They'll just go away. It's kind of like the lights are on and no one's home. They'll be back. They'll be back wherever, wherever in Iraq or whatever, wherever it might be, um, and that can be very, very distressing for them. Some people have dissociation where they wander. There's a condition called dissociative fugues, where people will just start wandering. Um, it's a rare condition, but people can wander. They'll take the train. They'll take the bus, um, and they have no recollection of who they are or where they're from. So you get these rare cases where people are sort of found to be just wandering aimlessly and, and you ask them who they are, they're like, I, I, I have no idea. And then for many of them, their sort of sense of, of themselves will come back. Dissociation is also seen in um, uh, what's called dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, which is a somewhat controversial diagnosis. Um, but there are certainly people who experience, I think on a regular basis, these dissociative states that can be very impairing. These individuals I think, are re really do struggle from a psychiatric point of view. Dissociation is most typically thought of as the result of trauma, right? So, so either childhood trauma, and one way that people think about it is that it's a protective mechanism. So that let's say a child that's being um, sexually abused, right, during the abuse might just go away. They would, their mind will go away as a way to protect them from the horror of what they're going through at that point in time. So that's one of the, I guess, models for how dissociation occurs. Dissociation is also closely related to psychosis. Many people with a psychotic disorder also have a high degree of dissociation. So it can range from severe to, 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 to really, really quite mild. And okay. So they've brought up all of these a lot of disorders, guys. Disassociation. Where is this going? Did Carly have a disassociation 
psychotic moment when they got home from school and she went and got the gun and killed her mother. She ki- her mother. Now, look, my my opinion, and I haven't heard any evidence to this. Now, a, parent, uh, a boy at school talks to the mother before they leave that day, tells her mother. Carly has things, uh, whether a phone, the weed pen, whatever. He tells her some things that Carly shouldn't be doing or having, right? Now, my opinion is, okay, so Carly's mother has this information before they leave the home. Do you think that her mother wouldn't have mentioned it on the way home? I'm thinking she did. No, I'm just speculating. I'm thinking she did. She said, oh, so I'm finding out through the grapevine that you've got uh, XYZ in your room and you're doing ABC and you ain't supposed to be. So what happens? They get home. Carly's taking the dogs out. And where does her mother go? Why would her mother go straight to her room? Because she has this information. And I'm assuming she talked about it because Carly was walking in and looking back down the hall. So Carly knows that her mom, I, I'm just speculating again, Carly knows her mom is in her room searching for stuff. So right then and there, does Carly disassociate? Did the voices tell her why she's disassociated? Will she have it? She doesn't even know what's going on. She goes back to the room, gets the gun, comes back, looks around. No one hide the gun from the camera, but she's disassociated. Now, I don't know if they're going to be using this in defense. I'm just speculating at this point. Because they're bringing up all of this stuff. Disassociating, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression. She has, uh, she stopped taking that, that medicine that was 50 milligrams because she had to start taking the five milligrams of Zoloft or the, uh, yeah, no, was it the Zoloft? The Zoloft was the 25. Then she had to go take the Zexapro with five, five milligrams. So, so all of these factors adding up to this has caused her and her being. Uh, traumatized as a as a child, and how and, and let's bring up let's bring up her dad. So her dad, in his testimony, they're asking him, "Have you ever seen her do this? Have you ever seen her act? Uh, whatever? Have you seen anything odd or anything? Nothing." He said, "No. He hadn't seen any of that." And that's a, now, I know he hadn't been with Carly since he was six, since she was six, I'm sorry, since she was six years old. But she's had all this trauma experience, supposedly. This has been traumatic for her. And now, and then they're saying that she has schizophrenic. She's schizophrenic. She's suffering from bipolar. She is depressed, and he has never seen it. And that's probably why they went over. Is this what typically teenagers can hide stuff? Man, if she had all of this and disassociation. Okay, so her mom and them knew she was she was depressed. But this is a whole litany of things that they are saying right now that this girl is supposedly suffering from. And that the stepdad never saw a clue. Oh, yeah, she seems happy, but yeah, she seemed a little down. Nothing out of the ordinary. I've never seen her angry. Like, raging. He's never seen her rage. And you think she is suffering from all of this. And there is no telltale sign inside the home? (sighs) That's some good deception on her part. Obviously, if she is suffering from all of these lists of disorders that they are going over. This is going to conclude part three of day three of Carly Griggs' murder trial.